Hello and welcome to this lecture on chemical process modeling and simulation. So far what we have learned in this course um, in the past three lectures is an introduction to the type of problems chemical engineers face in their careers, an introduction to modeling as a whole in the different types of models and how the whole process of modeling works. And then we uh, got an introduction to mathematical modeling how basically um, you know a, a process uh, or some phenomena whatever is being modeled can be represented mathematically what are the different types of mathematical representations we got uh, uh, exposed to a variety of examples practical examples of the different types of models including a couple of mathematical models as well in this lecture we are going to understand what is the mathematical modeling recipe suppose you are given a chemical process which is of course the focus of this course how does one go about developing a mathematical model of a chemical process this particular recipe what are all the steps involved so to speak right and that will be the focus of this particular lecture and to start this lecture i would like to draw to your attention what we discussed towards the end of the last which is that in mathematical models we are trying to develop a relationship between the output from any system that we are trying to model with the input to the system the relationship between the input and the output and in doing so this block diagram sort of emerges as a central um, sort of a piece of the puzzle central sort of approach that captures the central approach um, so when we are looking at of course in this course the course is about chemical process modeling so when we are looking at a process or a set of processes that occur in a unit or a set of units um, we are looking at what are all the pieces that go into developing the mathematical model for that particular process or processes we need to know what the input variables are the streams that go into that particular unit or set of units the streams that come out of that unit or set of units those are the output streams and we must be able to describe the unit itself or the set of units themselves and whatever processes take place to give an example suppose we consider heat transfer in a shell and tube heat exchanger then we would look at the hot fluid and the cold fluid streams that enter the heat exchanger as the input streams and the heated cold fluid and the cooled hot fluid exiting the heat exchanger as the output streams now if to describe the unit itself you would have to describe um, for example what is the overall heat transfer area because that directly pertains to the heat transfer process and for further details we will have to talk about the number of tubes the tube dia the tube pitch the shell dia right and um, then um, how, how does the fluid enter the shell um, and exit the shell how does the fluids enter the tube side exit the tube side all right and um, the uh, basically all the units that are present there um, and then the number of passes in the shell side number of passes in the tube side the material of construction and so on and so forth all of this would describe the unit of interest which is the shell and tube exchange then the moment you look at the heat transfer process itself now what is the uh, variable the, the classic variable that we, that captures the nature of the heat transfer process is the heat transfer coefficient now in addition to the heat transfer coefficient you should look at the range of temperatures range of pressures because you are looking at both flow and heat transfer taking place right so all of these would typically be the process variables and relating all of these would be a set of constraints or equations and those would essentially become the mathematical representation of the say for example the flow rate and the temperature of the output streams and the flow rate and temperatures of the input streams as well as the various unit and process variables 
So you would like to express the output as a function of input variables, unit variables and process variables. This is sort of the block diagram that captures the pieces that go into developing a mathematical model. Now, how do you go about what are the various steps involved? If you are to look at the modeling recipe, you first have to identify all the variables relevant to the systems, the input and output variables, okay, the, the variables related to the units and the processes. So there are stream input variables, stream output variables, unit variables and process variables. All these four will be dealt with individually in subsequent lectures. Then we have to write all the equations that constrain these variables that relate these variables to each other. And once you list all the variables and all the equations, you, these equations are known equations. You would have mass balance, you would have energy balance, you would have species balance, you would have momentum balance. You would have mechanical energy balance, you would have equilibrium relations, and then you would have various laws, rate laws. For example, you have, um, if it is continuing with the shell and tube heat exchanger, you have basically the relationship called um, Newton's law of cooling, essentially, which tells, which tells you the relationship between the heat transfer flux and the temperatures involved of the streams. Right? And then which, which brings about the definition of heat transfer coefficient. And then how do you obtain the overall heat transfer coefficient given the individual heat transfer coefficient and the thermal conductivity of the tube material, tube surface material. So that those would tell you, uh, those are all equations. And then of course, you know, which uh, you probably would not have uh, done any calculations with respect to a shell and tube exchanger, but this shell and tube exchanger would obviously have to be insulated. The shell side will have to be insulated uh, so that there is no heat loss. Um, and therefore, you know, what kind of insulation material, what is the, uh, the shell side material, what are the thermal conductivities of those, and what is the rate at which heat is lost through those um, materials and those problems you've solved, maybe not with respect to a shell and tube exchanger, but yes, those are also model equations if that is of interest, right? So once you write all of these equations, you have to perform what is called a degree of freedom analysis. What is the degree of freedom? It essentially tells us the number of variables that will have to still be specified. In other words, the number of independent variables that still have to be specified after considering all the variables in all the equations. Unless you specify all those independent variables, we will not be able to solve the model, model equations to obtain the performance output as a function of all those other variables that we talked about, input variables, unit variables, process variables. And that Degree of freedom, therefore, is simply given by the number of variables minus the number of equations. Um, at this point, I want to uh, point something out. Many of my students I have seen, the moment I talk about the degree of freedom, they talk immediately, they think of phase hold. And then they say, ah, F is equal to C minus P plus 2. Um, but you, if you recall, even there, the derivation of that degree of freedom for that particular problem of equilibrium across phases is uh, across phases that was the the degree of freedom was obtained by listing all the number of variables all the variables and all the equations and uh, subtracting the number of variables from uh, sorry sorry subtracting the number of equations from the number of variables and that's how you obtain the, the degree of freedom all right and if f is equal to zero then you have specified all the variables that have to be specified to solve the problem and the, the mathematical model is ready to solve. Then you have to ask yourself how many solutions are there for the problem. You know, once you um, get into modeling uh, complex systems that need not be just a single solution for a given set of model equations, in which case you have to ask yourself which of the solutions would be uh, physically meaningful. And what if you have more than one physically meaningful solution? Which of those solutions will actually manifest in 
um, in actual practice. And this is some problem that we will take up towards the end of uh, this modeling course where we will look at a, a problem which, which is a very, very simplified, oversimplified introduction to multiple steady states that are, that are possible in a reactor. And we will see how, depending on how the, the system is um, brought to steady state, you may, you may end up seeing one or another steady state. So that, that means there are more than one solution. There's more than one solution to the problem. And you could, you could uh, realize in practice either of those solutions. So that is, that is very interesting and, and uh, it leads to a lot of um, challenges uh, to chemical engineers. Finally, therefore, uh, if when you solve the problem, solve the equations, solve the mathematical model, that is what we call a simulation. Right? You can do the simulation on paper if it is a simple um, set of equations that you can solve analytically. Otherwise, if the equations are complex so that analytical solutions are not feasible, then you may have to write programs or use some sort of a um, software tool to solve to these, these model equations and that is a simulation done on a computer. Excuse me. And once you get the results, you have to interpret the results. Let us not forget that at the end of the day, all this modeling exercise is done not to just, you know, write solutions and neatly box them and say answer. It is to understand how a system behaves and, uh, you know, based on that understanding, determine how to operate a system or how to control a system and so on and so forth. So, Therefore, interpreting the results is, is of absolute uh, paramount importance. Therefore, this is basically the recipe. List all the variables, list all the equations, obtain the degree of freedom and specify all the independent variables so that you can solve the problem. Uh, the problem is closed and then explore before solving how many solutions there are. And for a given set of conditions, which basically is all the specifications of the independent variables, solve the problem and that is your simulation. You can do a variety of such simulations and interpret the results. So now in doing so, in doing this, this kind of uh, uh, modeling, we have to consider various steps. Now here is the, uh, here are the steps involved. Now in the reality, you have a very complex process. There could be some chemistry involved in the process. There could be some physics involved in the process. There could be some biology even involved in the process. There could be other things also like social behavior involved in the process. We were talking about in the last lecture, the modeling of spreading of a pandemic, a Corona COVID-19 pandemic. And, uh, you know, the whole spread depends on social behavior and you have to capture social behavior in some mathematical form. And biology, for example, you know, a simple example that I can think of is any enzymatic uh, uh, reactor or it could be a, an activated sludge process in, in uh, you know, wastewater treatment, sewage treatment, where you have this anaerobic, anaerobic bacterial growth um, and growth of various microorganisms, not nearly bacteria, right? So there is biology involved there and that has to be captured mathematically or you know you have biological processes that occur within our own body which you want to model mm -hmm. of course there will be biology involved mm -hmm. and chemistry and physics of course you know it, it's fairly straightforward um, you know everything from flow to um, you know heating to cooling to reactions to this mass transfer to mechanical separation and so on and so forth involves a whole bunch of physics all of this you have to write in a mathematical form and then you have to either solve analytically if you can or numerically if you have to. And then after all that, you still, in, even with the analytical solution, you have to do some numerical evaluation for various uh, conditions. And then you have to finally visualize the results, interpret the results. So this is the broad set of, uh, you know, various things that are involved, various pieces that are involved in modeling. Now. Um, what you're going to see now on the other side of this slide is something that uh, is a take home message for me that I've taken home from my PhD advisor uh, when I started working on modeling. He used to always tell me 
identify the most essential physics, chemistry and or biology relevant to the process. And that is here is here comes the art behind the modeling. You know, um, you, you are looking at, say, for example, coronavirus uh, spread, for example. All right. Uh, you know, you, you can always worry ah, this this micro droplets of of um, the saliva that come out from people just talking or sneezing or whatever they can get carried away in the they they hang around in the atmosphere and they can get carried away and so on and so forth and therefore that could in, impact the spread now if you are looking at a level of detail of the modeling where you are talking about okay here is a group of people and i am looking at to what extent is this these droplets present and um, how far do they travel and uh, how much of it comes into contact with other people in a very small confined well defined uh, region then that part those things become essential physics now we are looking at transport of um, you know sort of these uh, 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 this saliva particles these micro particles in in essentially aerosols under the conditions of wind certain wind certain temperature certain ambient conditions certain humidity and so on and so forth but now if you are looking at the same viral virus transmission at a larger scale in an entire city now you are looking at say a city of population of say 500 uh, 500000 uh, a million people for example very large city and you are looking at so many blocks and so many hospitals that kind of infrastructure this kind of um, you know uh, we were talking about this in the last lecture the kind of jobs and um, business uh, infrastructure that is available the kind of uh, city planning transport infrastructure that is available which sort of brings people together in in large environments we want to capture uh, in the in that big picture of how the virus is being transmitted probably the wind speed at a certain location uh, in the city is an overkill you probably don't need that at that level of modeling right at the big picture level of modeling so you ha you have to have the knack of determining what is the most essential physics uh, and that determines the most essential variables that you have to consider so remember we talked about list the variables first and then list the relevant equations uh, you don't want to overkill uh, by by writing all kinds of variables so you have to know at what scale you are modeling and at that particular scale what are the most relevant variables which you rec can recognize by identifying what is the most essential physics chemistry and or biology relevant to the process this is something that is gathered with experience all right and in chemical engineering processes throughout the various courses that you have taken so far this is what has been taught to you the moment you talk about modeling an ideal csdr the most essential variables are the inlet flow rate inlet concentration temperature outlet flow rate outlet concentration or conversion temperature the reactor volume and the temperature conditions in the reactor so we don't you were never taught every every CSTR uh, you know picture schematic will have an uh, some sort of an agitator or an impeller nobody ever told you to write any um, uh, you know the RPM with which this this impeller is agitated the power of that motor associated with the impeller as essential variable so you know so the assumption that was made was that there was perfect mixing and when there is not perfect mixing that is captured with these very same variables using rtd by looking at the the residence time as a uh, uh, random variable as a stochastic variable rather i should say and then you know so there is a framework that is generated by using a certain set of essential physics and which is described by a set essential variables so understanding what to leave and what to consider we've been taught all of these in various courses if, whether or not this this has been explicitly stated to you it this this is this is something that actually is familiar for the kind of chemical processes 
that you have seen so far in your various chemical engineering courses. But for the rest of uh, the processes you may encounter, so many new new processes that you may yourself develop or you may face in, a, in an industry or when you do research or uh, when you, you know, social process. Now we are all confronted with this coronavirus spread. Everybody is trying to scratch their head, trying to understand how this spreads, the virus spreads, right? And so, you know, you have to be able to think and apply yourself and determine what is the most essential physics, chemistry and our biology relating to that process. And that's an art and um, backed by science. Right? So, so this is what my PhD advisor used to say. He used to emphasize that essential, cut out all the non-essential ones. And once you have done this, for which you have to make probably sometimes very serious approximations, but you should test the validity of those approximations that it is it is fair to make those approximations once you've done all that write the most accurate mathematical description of the identified physics chemistry or biology so what he used to say is don't compromise on the mathematics compromise when you want to think in terms of the physics of the problem understand what is critical what is essential once you have fixed that parameter those parameters all right. Write the most accurate possible mathematical description of that identified physics, chemistry or biology. And then, of course, then you need to solve that and get the solution. That is the simulation. But the most important part in this, because as I was telling you, it's not is exact science. Sometimes there is some amount of judgment involved. You always have to verify, calibrate and validate. These are three very crucial steps involved in any modeling. And those are the next three slides that we are going to see. In solving a mathematical model, always verify. What do you mean by verify? So if you say that I have identified this essential physics and I've written the most accurate mathematical description and I'm solving this uh, model and I'm getting some results, is the model able to sufficiently able to capture the physics of simple test cases? Let us take, for example, residence time distribution in CSTR, which we were just talking about some time back. Right? The simple case would be the case of an ideal reactor. So if I collapse my RTD into my ideal, uh, take the mean RTD, am I kept getting back the CSTR equations that I that I studied upfront when I was modeling an ideal CSTR. It should. If I have not done, then there is some deep bug in the, in the whole process. You may have, you know, you may have uh, written in your paper, pen, paper pencil or you may have done your simulation on a computer. Doesn't matter. There is a bug. There is a mistake. Is the mistake in the physics, chemistry, biology? You may have thought that some this, this, this is the essential physics, chemistry, biology. Probably not. You may have missed out on something. Or you may have considered something that may not be necessary. Is the error in the mathematical formulation? Okay. Have you written the equations correctly? Have, have you obtained the equations correctly? Is the error in the analytical or numerical solution? Is it in the simulation? Mm -hmm. Then the, the last two are somewhat a little crucial, particularly is the error in the choice of the parameters. In other words, what are the independent variables? What are the dependent variables? Now, what are the variables I am specifying? All right. Have I made the right choice in that? And have I assigned the correct values for the parameters that I specify? For example, specific heat capacity in a heat exchanger or, um, you know, viscosity in a pipe flow. Have I put in the right kind of values? Density of a fluid. How does density vary with temperature? Have I, have I considered that, that, that correctly? And so on and so forth. So is the error in the visualization? Believe it or not, there are many occasions that I have personally seen where everything is correct. And when you plotted some sort of a graph, uh, some sort of a curve to, to capture the behavior, you made a mistake and then you think that something is wrong. So it could be something very simple at the end of the day. So, but this is the verification for the various simple test cases that you should be able to think of when you model a complex uh, system. For those simple cases, you should, your model should reduce to those cases correctly. That is verification. The second thing in solving a mathematical model, always calibrate. What do I mean by calibration? 
are the parameters used in the model sensible? This is what I was trying to tell you in the last slide towards the end. Suppose you are modeling the diffusion process. What value did you assign to the diffusion coefficient? Where did you get this from? Suppose you say I got it from some literature, some paper. What do you mean by that some paper? Does that literature study conduct an experiment or a calculation? Does that experiment or the modeling simulation that that, that paper uh, you know presented in, the, in that particular paper, does that contain the same essential physics as your model? Meaning you are looking at say for example one dimensional diffusion in a certain pipe under certain conditions for some species. Now have they done something similar? Is the essential physics there the same as the essential physics here? Okay. So even then, even if you take it, take that value, even if you say that that is indeed true, what can cause variations from the experimental or calculated value and what will be the range of such variations? And this is a very, very critical thing to look at. This is called parameter sensitivity. Suppose I have a diffusion coefficient or a... Um, or a, a, you know, a specific heat or viscosity or, um, you know, a coefficient of thermal expansion. I could have any particular parameters like this that go into the models all the time. Thermal conductivity, right? So what if I change this value? Sometimes even hypothetically change this value. What happens to the predicted behavior? Is this model so sensitive or is the behavior that is obtained by simulating the model so super sensitive to the choice of values of the parameters in the range that is usually probably going to be seen. More sensitive a parameter is, more critical it is to define it correctly. You have to really look at the variations that could be caused with a very, very fine critical eye. And therefore, you know, the more sensitive a parameter variation is, unless you, you capture that variation appropriately, the interpretations that you make could be absolute nonsense compared to whatever actually manifests. Because say 5% variation in a parameter, if suddenly if it, it doubles your output value, then you may think that something has happened, but something else may end up getting reflected in, in the actual uh, system. And therefore, this perform, uh, sorry, parameter sensitivity is a very critical um, aspect of calibrating a model. The last step is in solving a mathematical model, always validate. This is the toughest but the most essential of the steps. This, of course, is the benchmark, ultimate benchmark, in that this step proves that the model faithfully reproduces a real experimental process of behavior processes in a unit. Remember what we talked about. A mathematical model of a chemical uh, process model is an approximate mathematical representation of a set of processes that occur in a unit or a set of units. So that validation has to happen. All right. In doing so, you have to keep in mind that model must sufficiently capture the behavior of the process at the length and time scale model is developed. We will have a specific set of lectures on length scales and time scales in modeling. So I will just give you this example. There is a molecular length, uh, length and time scale. There is microscopic or a sort of a um, continuum uh, length scale, time scale, macroscopic length scale, time scale. Now, if a model is developed to look at mass and energy balance over a period of one month, it cannot pro probably capture correctly the uh, species conservation when I'm looking at uh, one millisecond or one nanosecond or something like that, where a few molecules are involved, they come in, they undergo some change and they go out, right? So, um, you know, time scale wise, I have to be sensible. Same way with length scale, I have a large. Uh, uh, reactor and I assume that the reactor is uniformly mixed, you know, mixed flow reactor. And then I try to do an experiment in terms of what is the variation of the mixing characteristics in a very small region of some microliter volume in the reactor. Obviously, I'm not going to see uniform mixing. 
you know in one end microliter and other end microliter are two different parts of the reactor i'm not going to see that right so i have to be sensible in terms of this validation happening at the correct length scale and time scale sometimes what becomes essential is that the um, in order to develop a mathematical model at the length and time scale of your interest you will need information data parameters from the behavior of the system at a much smaller length scale or time scale this basically means you have to develop multi scale models okay and then this multi scale models how are they developed we will see one example of how this happens in this course so where you have a smaller length scale shorter time scale models which are the molecular or microscopic models that get incorporated into a larger length scale longer time scale model a simple example that i can give you right away is in your chemical reaction engineering a catalytic system you would have looked at um, you know a reaction at a catalytic particle surface there is one spherical catalytic particle diffusion to the particle reaction at the surface you may have pores inside the pores whatever happens and so on and so forth but this catalytic particle is part of a probably a large packed bed reactor so in the the models that you studied the thiel modulus and all that effectiveness factor and all that you studied that would be for a single particle now how do you develop what is the sort of conversion that you are going to get how do you predict what would be the conversion that you are going to get in that entire packed bed reactor from beginning to end at the end at the exit what conversion will i get so for doing this i have to account for how much reaction takes place at each spherical catalytic particle which means i have to essentially integrate from one end of the catalytic reactor to the other end of the catalytic reactor so there are there are ways to sort of you know incorporate this smaller scale model of a single particle into the larger model of a packed bed so for that i have to have some information in terms of how this catalytic particle is packed into a bed so given a cross sectional area what is the porosity how many particles what is the density of the catalytic particles and then i just say if i have a one dimensional model i say that at that cross sectional area all the temperature um, inlet concentration and all that is equal so i do the um, develop the models for all those particles so then at the exit at the exit of that particular cross sectional area i have a certain conversion and then i keep doing this integrating it along the length of the, the catalytic reactor and i will get my final solution so this is this is a classic multi scale model all right so uh, there are these kind of multi scale models that will be developed and therefore you know when you are looking at the uh, validation of such a model you know you should obviously be looking at the uh, since you are probably going to test the model at a, in a, using a packed bed catalytic reactor you will have to sort of um, integrate that uh, you know um, uh, reaction in a single catalytic particle porous catalytic particle you will have to integrate the out, output that you get from there across the entire bed and then only do the validation then only the validation will make sense otherwise it will not make sense all right so with that we come to an end of this particular lecture if there are any questions uh, once again please feel free to um, post them at the um, comment section below um, in the in the uh, page and i'd be very happy to answer them uh, have a wonderful day thank you very much